So we're now going to look at the mickelson morley experiment. The mickelson morley experiment was performed by Michelson and Morley back in 1887 and it was designed to measure the speed of the earth as it moved through the ether. So at the time it was thought that the ether was found throughout space. The ether was literally a preferred reference frame against which the movement of everything could be measured. So as it was well understood that the earth was going around the sun, it was thought that in different seasons at different times of year, the earth would have a different speed through the ether. And this experiment was set up to measure this speed. So the experimental setup is shown here. We've got a coherent source of light. This travels along to a beam splitter. So the beam splitter was a partially silvered mirror which reflected some of the light up an arm with length L and some of the light was transmitted through another arm with length L. At the ends of these arms we have mirrors to reflect the light back. Once the light gets back, some of it's transmitted, some of it's reflected down to the analyzer, which is an interferometer, which looks for the interference pattern between the lights coming from the two arms. So interestingly, a very similar experimental setup is used in the LIGO experiment, the Laser interferometer gravi Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory, which has recently detected gravitational waves. So let's consider now what they were expecting to see back in 1887. Okay, so we're going to consider light passing through this beam splitter here. We'll label the position of the beam splitter as A, and then some of the light travels along this arm to this mirror, and we'll call the location of this mirror B, and then some of it travels up this arm to the mirror here, which we will say is located at C, and this length here is given by L. This length here is given by L. Now we will suppose that this setup is moving through the ether with a speed u along the direction of the horizontal arm. So what we're going to do now is calculate how much time does the light spend in this arm. So the light travels from here to A to here at B. But as the light is traveling, the apparatus is moving through the ether. So by the time it gets to this mirror, this mirror has actually moved on and is now at this new location that we will call B dash. So let's let the time spent traveling from A to B, B, T, 1. Okay, it's actually to B dash. And so what we want to do is calculate T1. So we know that the time is equal to the distance over the speed. So the distance it travels, it travels this distance L and then this extra distance. Now this extra distance is actually equal to UT1 because it's how far this mirror B has moved. So the distance it's traveled is the L plus UT1 and it's light, it's traveling with speed C. So what we're trying to do is find T1. So let's rearrange this. We've got CT1 is equal to L plus UT1. So we can write, well, T1, C minus U, moving this term over to the other side, is equal to L. So the time spent in going from A to this location here, B dash, is equal to L over C minus U. Okay, now we're going to try and get the total time spent in this arm. So from when it goes to here, to here and back. So we will now reflect the light off this B dash. Now when this mirror B is at B dash, this mirror A is at A dash, this distance here 
is also equal to ut1. So the distance between these two mirrors is still L. But now as the light is traveling back this way, this mirror continues to travel along. So this mirror continues to travel along as well, but we don't really care about that one. Now, when the light is reflected back off this mirror, it travels back. But meanwhile, this mirror A dash has actually been moving forwards with the speed U. So it ends up at some location here. Let's call this A double dash. And if we let T2 be the time it takes light to travel from B dash to A double dash, then we've got, well, T2 is equal to the distance divided by the speed. And the distance in this case is going to be L minus this distance. But this distance here, how far this has traveled is given by UT2. So this will be equal to L minus UT2 over C, speed of light. And so we can rearrange this and we end up with CT2 is equal to L minus UT2. And moving this over to this side and taking T2 out as a common factor, we end up with T2 is equal to L over C plus U. So now we've got the time it takes to get to B dash and then the time it takes to get back to this beam splitter. So the total time in arm one is equal to T1 plus T2. So this is equal to L over C minus U from up here plus L over C plus U from here. So this is equal to C minus U, C plus U, giving it a common denominator times L C plus U plus L C minus U. And so this is equal to L C plus L U plus L C minus L U over this, which we can write as C squared minus U squared as it's the difference of two squares. And so these cancel and we end up with two L C over C squared minus U squared. Okay, so we've calculated how much it spends in this horizontal arm. Let's now consider, well, what goes on in this vertical arm? So in this case, the light travels from A to C. As it's traveling to C, the mirror C does move on. So it's moved on from here to here. And this distance here will be given by U times the time. And let's call this time T3. So the light is actually going up along this path here. And so to calculate the time, so let T3 be time from A to C dash. And so T3 is once again equal to the distance over the speed. Now this time we've got this distance. Now this here is a right angle triangle. So to get this distance, we need to use Pythagoras. This is equal to the square root of L squared plus UT3 squared. So we've got um, the distance is given by the square root of L squared plus UT3 squared divided by the speed, which is C. So we can write, well, C times T3 is equal to the square root of L squared plus UT3 squared. Let's square both sides. So we've got C squared T3 squared is equal to L squared plus U squared T3 squared. So pulling T3 out is a common factor, T3 squared. We've got C squared minus U squared is equal to L squared. So rearranging this, we've got, well, T3 is equal to L. We're taking the square root now over the square root of C squared minus U squared. So that's the time it takes to come up. Now, as it's going back, it's going to be very symmetric. This mirror A here will move on and it'll come back to the new location of mirror A. In that time, it's traveled a mirror A has traveled a distance UT4, if we wanted to call it that. And this length here would be exactly the same as this, but with a T4. So in fact, if we work through the maths, we'll end up with T4 is exactly the same as this. 
So the total time, sorry, let's put this over here. Total time in vertical arm or arm two is equal to, so it we need to sum these. So it ends up being 2L over the square root of C squared minus U squared. So we've got this time in one arm and this time in another arm. Now these are not the same. They are different expressions. So it's spending different amounts of time in the two arms. So Mickelson and Morley were expecting to see an interference pattern as it spent different amounts of time in the two arms. So if it was initially in phase, then when it comes back to this mirror, it should be out of phase. And so there should be a interference pattern which changes with a changing U. So we've seen that as the Earth moves through the ether, the light spends different amounts of time in the two arms. And as it spends different amounts of time in the two arms, if the light was initially coherent, by the time it gets to the analyzer, it should no longer be coherent. And so we should get different interference patterns depending on how quickly the whole apparatus is moving through the ether. In fact, no changing interference pattern was observed. So the Mickelson-Morley experiment gave a null result. They did not manage to move to, they did not manage to measure the movement of the earth through the ether. So this actually is evidence for Einstein's theory of special relativity because one of Einstein's postulates was that there is no preferred reference frame. The ether would be a preferred reference frame. So the null result of the michelson morley experiment supports Einstein's theory. So we're going to have a look at a few more implications of Einstein's theory now and how we can use these implications to show that we actually expect a null result from the michelson morley experiment.